I'm investigative journalist Molly Barrows. For years, I've covered the stories that made headlines in Northwest Florida and all along the Gulf Coast. Murders. Missing persons. And mysteries of all kinds. These cases are far from over for many victims because the full story has yet to surface. Join me for Gulf Coast Confidential, where I dive into the saltier side of the South and expose the lies, greed, and corruption that often weighs down the truth. It's time to turn the tide and get a shot at justice. Hi, I'm Molly Barrows, a longtime reporter in Florida's Panhandle, and welcome to my investigative series, Gulf Coast Confidential, where I dive into the saltier stories that surface in Northwest Florida and all along the Gulf of Mexico. My co-host is Pam Hill. Pam, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. As always, we love having Pam on Gulf Coast Confidential. She brings a unique perspective. Her sister was killed by her own son on Christmas Eve of 2013, and Pam has a lot of wisdom to share in a lot of these cases that I talk about here on Gulf Coast Confidential. This episode is called From Mayday to Payday, The Bumbled Pseudocide of a Wannabe Yuppie. What are we talking about? Well, in 2009, former financial advisor Marcus Schrinker attempted to fake his own death, what's called pseudocide, to escape personal, financial, and legal problems. The 39-year-old Indiana man had it all at the time. A beautiful wife, three healthy children, a million-dollar home, a private plane, and a fancy car. But it was a life all built on lies. And on January 11, 2009, it all came crashing down, beginning with a mid-air mayday call that ended up in a multi-state three-day manhunt. Pam, I have to tell you, I was anchoring for the local ABC affiliate at the time when this story happened. And, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. We all know the beginning and the mm-hmm. end. But at the time it was unfolding, it was just unbelievable. It was like this this plane went down. They're trying to find the pilot. He called for Mayday, but he wasn't connected. And it mm-hmm. went down in our viewing area, you know, in, in Milton. And then suddenly he was found at this campground outside of Tallahassee. There was this suicide attempt. And everybody's like, who is this guy? Who is Marcus Shrinker? Why did he jump out of a plane? And it's like, is he some sort of like mission impossible? <laughs> or as you say, Kim possible yeah, sort right. of? It, it was not the most well-orchestrated yeah. plane. But it was just so flamboyant as to draw national headlines for years. Oh, yeah. It was so almost goofballish to me because then an email came out, a secret email came to one of his friends about him that says, I want to tell my story. So it's just all this craziness. To me, he's like a cross or mashup between like Pinocchio Joe. Bernie Madoff, uh, James Bond, and let's just go ahead and throw <laughs> Evil Knievel in there. I you know? know. That's a great description. <laughs> Evil Knievel with the motorcycle because yeah. the motorcycle, I mean, yeah. it's planes, trains, automobiles, yeah. you name it. He's trying every way he can yeah. to escape responsibility because he had a lot of trouble building up mm-hmm. in Indiana. His mm-hmm. wife had basically just filed for divorce. She, This was all the end of 2008. So this went down in beginning of 2009. Well, at the end of 2008... His gorgeous wife is filing for divorce because she's accused him of having an affair with a woman at the airport where he kept his private plane. Okay. Um, and then he's he's basically being sued. He owns these three companies uh, as a financial advisor, and he's being sued for basically, you know, they want his commission back, right. $1.4 million. Mm-hmm. So he's being charged with unlawful acts or being investigated for mm-hmm. these unlawful financial acts. And then his wife's leaving him, and he's looking at potentially having his license removed as a financial mm-hmm. advisor. I think the state had been pursuing that as well. So lo and behold, suddenly I guess he decides he's going to fake his death mm-hmm. and, uh, and 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 sort of a, a quickly failed attempt, but it was right. just so insanely complicated. Yeah. I mean, he took off from an airfield in Anderson, Indiana. It was a turboprop single-engine plane, and he was on his way to Destin, Florida. That's right here on the Gulf Coast, y'all. If you're not familiar with Destin, Florida, it's where a lot of celebrities like to vacation now. It's crazy because I grew up in, you know, that area. That area. <laughs> I went to Niceville High School, waited tables and worked retail in and around that area. And I remember when Destin was really blowing up and starting to become this, you know, Riviera type place, if you will, for a lot of the, the rich and famous. I oh, mean, right. There's a yeah. lot of celebrities that, that still come here and live here. But anyway, that's where he was on his way to, which was not unusual. But it was around your neck of the woods in Birmingham. Yeah. 
that he made this distress call and he's like, my windshield's imploded. Mm -hmm. I'm bleeding. Mm -hmm. Help, help, help. Mm -hmm. He tells traffic control. But, you know, unbeknownst to these emergency crews, it was all a lie. And he had actually just went ahead and set his plane to autopilot and parachuted out. Yep. Right yep. afterwards. Yeah. But he even took that ruse a little further because he had about six air traffic controllers from the Atlanta airport trying to help him. He's like, permission to descend, you know, and my windshield's cracked. I'm bleeding, this, that, and the other. So they send some Air Force, uh, I forget what they are, F-15s Military or whatever. Military jets. Right, to intercept him, you know, because they're thinking that if you're bleeding, you're under duress, if the windshield has spidered or cracked, as they say, that's a big problem because m my dad was a private pilot. We had a little small plane that we would just hop around and go places with. And that is nothing to play with. My dad is as happy and Disneyland dad as my dad was. When we were up in that plane, everything was just business. I mean, we had fun and stuff, but my dad would say when the radio squawks, everybody has to stop talking. And he, I mean, he was very, very safe about it or my mom went and let us go up. Right. And, it, and we had to file a travel plan and log, and Daddy had to log all that in and stuff. So I can't imagine that he had time to do all that stuff up there and stuff and have them running around, but he did. And so then he does that, like you said, over Birmingham, but then he parachutes out. He leaves the cockpit door open trying to get out. He tears or, or shreds his parachute a little bit because it gets caught on the door. So I guess he goes tumbling down to Childersburg area and uh, Harpersville, you know, kind of that area of Alabama. Yeah. And I was reading up on that a little bit, too. And they talked about how the military jets, they ended up catching up with the plane mm -hmm. and they saw that the door was open. They saw that the windshield was intact. Um, and they certainly found all this when the plane ended right. up crashing. But and yeah, no blood. It, no blood. Right. <laughs> and, and the cockpit was empty. Mm -hmm. um, but they followed that plane. It flew on autopilot for like 200 miles. Mm -hmm. They monitored it until it crashed right here on the Gulf Coast in Milton, Florida. That's Santa Rosa County. Right next door to Pensacola. A lot of bedroom communities. Mm -hmm. People that yeah. will go to school, they'll live in Santa Rosa and they'll work in Pensacola. But that was the night of January 11th. Um, and like we talked about, you know, his life had sort of been in disarray. So he had uh, several reasons on multiple fronts that apparently he wanted to avoid facing responsibility. Um, but what was crazy to me is that it went down in like 75 yards. This plane ended up crashing. If he had closed the door, mm -hmm. like to your point, mm -hmm. it might have gone out and crashed in the Gulf. And they would never have known that mm -hmm. this was uh, all made up. It right. might have disappeared in the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. But instead, it went down to Milton, Florida, mm -hmm. 75 feet, 50 to 75 feet from a residential neighborhood. Yes. They didn't find any blood. The windshield's totally fine. Um, but they did find a U.S. atlas and a directory for national campgrounds. And both of those had pages removed for Alabama and Florida. So where was Marcus Shrinker, Pam? <laughs> what was he doing? His well, he was up in, he's still fooling around and finding out how middle Alabama is. Double O. Right. Dumb Double way o. of trying to escape. Double O, dummy. And so <laughs> he, he was up there trotting around in the Coosa River, I reckon. And so he comes out and the police even see him up there in that Yeah, it's area. Childersburg, Alabama. Yeah. You're right. It's like 2.30 yeah. in the morning. He what, knocks mm -hmm. on somebody door and he's like, I had a canoeing accident. At 2.30, believable. Right? Yeah. Well, I think he was wet. Too. Yeah. Well, I mean, so what? I mean, 2.30 yeah. in the morning. Right. I guess that was his <laughs> proof. Yeah. So anyway, didn't they help him get a hotel room? And I don't think he spends a night in the hotel room, but then he disappeared. Well, apparently he paid cash for it. Yeah. yeah. So they, they, they drive him into town. They tell the police. It's like, oh, I'm going to stay here at this motel room. But by the time mm -hmm. they go knock on his door, he's gone. He right. took off on foot the next morning. Yeah. And or then, maybe he didn't even spend the night. Yeah. I, no, I don't think he did. I don't think he went in there. And then he has a red motorcycle stashed somewhere with saddlebags with money. So, I mean, here we go. Here's Pinocchio Joe meets James Bond. And so he gets on his motorcycle and he heads down near us this way Naturally. to Quincy, Florida, to a KOA. That's right. A, a KOA campground mm -hmm. right outside of right. Tallahassee. I, I've passed it so much. And when I look over there, I'm like, man, I didn't know all that Tom Cruise stuff was going on over there. He wishes he could be as You're cool as Tom Cruise. <laughs> He's more like <laughs> Scientology Tom Cruise. <laughs> Hopping on the couch. Yeah. I have to give him credit that some of this stuff, you know, I mean, it's like, excuse me, sir, um, you forgot your airplane, you know, right, right. here around Birmingham. Uh -huh. But he's keeping on going. I mean, how, how... Kind of smart, but 
I don't know, out of touch. On the execution. Yeah. I don't think he knew that they would send military jet fighters I after him. But he didn't. He fooled around and found out. Right, didn't he? right. I know. So from the beginning, there were holes in his story. Mm-hmm. It wasn't going according to plan from the get go. But he did get pretty far. They yeah. just caught up with him pretty quickly. And yeah. part of it was because at that campground, he had signed on to internet. Mm-hmm. But because of his bizarre behavior, he was also on the radar right. of other people that were mm-hmm. staying there. Right. And he had, during this time, he had sent his friend, Tom Britt. An email, because I remember seeing this on the news and going, wait, what? I didn't understand the story. But Tom Britt seemed like a regular little business guy to me. And he's going, well, he said, I want you to tell my story. He said when he was reading that, he's like, I ain't telling nothing until I see what's going on here. With yeah, because he sent him an email saying, yeah, you've probably heard about the mm-hmm, crash. Mm-hmm. It was just a misunderstanding. Right, right. I'm embarrassed and scared. Yeah, and minimizing it. I'm but, just on the run. Yeah, they found him. The manager of the KOA found him in his little Pop up, up place, yeah. He found him because he had uh, taken a handful of oxys and he had taken some blood thinners and he had cut his wrist. Yeah, they said there was a stain mm-hmm. on the tent and they yeah. called authorities, and authorities yeah. were actually already narrowing down because they. Mm-hmm. Right. Had indications in the email right. of where to find them, basically. The, the guy, though, the KOA guy, came in there was like, your rent's due. <laughs> you know, your tent rent. <laughs> Quit leading. It's time right. to pay up. So then right. he goes and, and tells the story. Yeah, that's interesting. So authorities did come, and they found him, just like you described. Mm-hmm. He was bleeding profusely. They were giving him medical care. He was mumbling, they said. He didn't seem to be entirely coherent. But uh, I just remember, again, like, at the time, we just I, I just couldn't believe it. Every time you think – because, I mean, you hear crazy stuff in yeah. news. You really do. I mean – to this point, I mean, I'd, I'd been, you know, reporting for so long that I remember when 9-11 happened, mm-hmm. I was actually in the airport at Atlanta, and a girl came out of um, a restaurant that was next door to where we were waiting to board the plane, and she's telling a loved one, you won't believe it, these planes hit the trade, the World Trade Center Tower, these planes hit the... And, and none of us even really looked up, because my first thought went to, oh, it was a Cessna. Yeah, a I had little. covered. I'd seen other mm-hmm. stories like that happen in Florida or somebody's practicing on a plane and whatever happens, there's an accident and they go in. I had no idea that it was a enormous passenger planes that had gone into the building. Obviously, that was a whole other story. But to your point, in news, you hear a lot of crazy things. This story just never stopped being crazy. <laughs> no. Like from the moment mm-hmm. that the, the jet fighters are following this plane that crashes in Milton and then where's the pilot? Oh, his name is Marcus Shrinker. He's from Indiana. He's this financial advisor who's facing some financial trouble and some personal issues. Oh, we found him in a campground. Oh, he was yeah. trying to kill himself. And, and that is tragic. I mean, mm-hmm. clearly this yeah, is a person that, that. Mm-hmm. that is stressed yeah. and they are suffering and they're making mm-hmm. some poor decisions, if you yes. will, whether or not the drugs contributed to some of that, whether or not the stress from the relationship, whether or not the stress of what he was facing with his business falling apart. You know, I don't mean to minimize yeah. that. We all struggle mm-hmm. with stress. We all have ways of trying to decompress and deal with that. His is to pull this extravagant, you know, escape mission, mm-hmm. if you will, escaping from all his problems. But all he did was compound mm-hmm. them for other people. Mm-hmm. The embarrassment that he brought to his family, mm-hmm. the the stress and the pain that he brought to the clients that apparently were saying oh, that they'd been goodness, ripped yeah. off. Yeah. And then just constantly, you know, whether whether it's those, those jet fighters that were following his plane or whether it's the authorities that are looking for him or the other campgrounds that have to deal with this guy that's tried to semi attempted to mm-hmm. suicide if yep. that's if it truly was a a, a sincere attempt yeah. which it, I guess it appeared to be but at any rate it just seemed like all of his attempts were just all geared towards him. There was no mm-hmm. thought of others. No. Whether it was the people that mm-hmm. could have died when that plane crashed. Yes, that was that you know? was the main thing, I think. I kept reflecting. And I was thinking, too, since my dad, I did have some experience being in my dad's plane and watching my dad's reverence for the hobby, if you will. It was my dad's hobby. And they said Marcus Shrinker started out selling insurance to other pilots because he knew how to talk to them. Mm-hmm. That's what he started out doing. And he's a very good businessman as far selling, but he kind of got the numbers mixed up, doing the flim flam, aram aram type of thing. But to me, my dad learned how to fly at Ferguson's Field out on the west side of town, which is a grass field. And the west side of Pensacola? mm -hmm, Daddy said he wanted to learn there in case he had to have a May Day or something because he knew if he could take off and land on grass, he could definitely do it on on a paved asphalt one. And he would even tell us when we were, we were flying around, he'd go, where would be a good place to drop this plane down if we needed to? And he would teach us, go with the traffic on the interstate or make your call. You wouldn't go toward them or look at that field over there. And pilots are always thinking like that. They're not up there changing the uh 
CD or the iPod or whatever. Making up stories. Yeah, no, they're not doing that. And I, I don't know anybody that uh, has jumped out of a plane with a parachute, especially a little plane like these we're talking about. Well, and the fact that he tore it on the door on mm-hmm. the way out. Yeah. I mean, just from the beginning, it didn't yeah. sound like he, it was very well yeah. executed. And he didn't. He, he did not have that reverence and respect that I thought pilots would naturally have, you know, even for your, just yourself if you're up there. And so that made me think about things. But he also was a daredevil, and he was a stunt pilot, too. He was good at that. Uh, I mean, I feel like that's a thing with pilots in general. Yeah. Most of them yeah. that I've met, they, they are sort of thrill seekers. Yeah. You have to be to want yeah, to do to that. to go up there. Yeah, because, like, my sisters would show interest in flying when we'd be up there, but not me. If Dad was like, take the yoke or whatever, I'd jump in the back seat. I was like, I don't want to because I, I was scared of that. I'm not scared with daddy. I'd be as scared with me, you know, but I just did not feel that's like something's wrong here, you know, just from knowing that. Right. I know. And as the story unfolded, it just became such a huge national story on multiple levels because Mm -hmm. of the nature of his business. There were financial publications and productions that were interested in his story. There was, you know, everything from People magazine to the Wall Street Journal to Forbes. I mean, everybody's interested in what's going on with Marcus Mm -hmm. Shrinker. And Part of me sitting there on the anchor desk and watching this all unfold is like, yeah, way to give him all the oxygen he wants. <laughs> right. You know, because here's, here's a guy that yeah. just can't seem to find enough right. ways to, you know. Be seen. Be seen, <laughs> yeah. get those ego strokes, mm-hmm. and, and, and yet nothing's really his yeah. fault when right. you hear him talk right. about it. It's grandiose. I mean, all this is grandiose. It's like exciting men in black type thing. Let mm-hmm. me get not only a motorcycle, let me get a red motorcycle and let me put money satchels on it and let me put it in a storage shed and be headed out. He thought out. he was born to be wild. I, get, I don't know. He was born to be caught. Yeah, because, he was. Yeah. And I do think that he had some issues maybe bipolar and grandiosity see that. and the uh, just delusional thinking. Because, I mean, really, I, you see a lot of people that are in the financial world. You really don't see that many that are successful that say, line up all my toys out front, make sure my wife has a mommy makeover, and then come out here and take our picture. Right. And and, and what Pam's referring to, if, if you're not familiar with Marcus Shrinker, go ahead and give it a Google. And uh, that's <laughs> S-C-H-R-E-N-K-E-R. And the first thing that pops up, and it's Marcus with a C, M-A-R-C-U-S, mm-hmm. but when the first thing that pops up are those pictures that, you know, he mm-hmm. had had. And I mean, the wife is just beautiful. Yeah, she's gorgeous. You know, mm-hmm. classic beauty, long blonde mm-hmm. hair. Hair, beautiful black dress in this photo. I think it's like almost looking like a plane slash car commercial uh-huh. with the sun setting and the slightly, you know, the pretty pinkish colors in the background and the plane and him and, the, and her. And they're both dressed very lovely, almost sort of mm-hmm. black tie, if you will. And, and I can't remember if the car's in there or not. But, it, you know, again, not to be a cynic, but just sitting up there in news, you see pictures like this come across. And it's almost like a, a look at me glamour shot. Yeah. You know, look at, like you're to your point, mm-hmm. all these toys. Look at all my look at all my prized possessions. Mm-hmm. Even the wife was a prized possession. Mm-hmm. Even the, the car, the plane. It's about me, 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 me. Right. And when it was all falling apart, it was still about me, 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 me. Right. Let me get away so it can be you, you, you that holds the bag and right. not me, me, me. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. That takes a lot of work. I think about that a lot. And I think he was in the Air Force also in special ops. So I think he knew some of this tough guy stuff mm-hmm. and, and could figure it out. But it, to me, it, it's like Keystone Cop situation going wrong. Yeah, it absolutely is a Keystone Cop. And, he, and, and you know, right after he was uh, caught, essentially, if you will, they started to freeze his assets. They realized he was trying to get away. And uh, he was arrested on a variety of charges. In Indiana, he faced like 11 counts related to unlawful acts and transactions. As a financial advisor, his bail was set there for $4 million. Mm-hmm. In Alabama, a judge granted a $12 million judgment against him related to the sale of that airplane to an Alabama man. And he later pleaded guilty to federal charges of destroying an aircraft and making the U.S. Coast Guard essentially respond when no help was really needed. So he ended up in 2009, he was sentenced to four years and three months in prison, nearly a million dollars in restitution and damages to the Coast Guard and the lien lien holder of the plane. And by August 2010, his possessions had all been sold off and there were civil claims against him totaling about $20 
million. Right. So in August of 2010, he actually reached a deal with Indiana prosecutors. He pled guilty to five counts of securities fraud, served 10 years in prison, and paid victims of his schemes like more than 630000 is what he was ordered. And in October, that judgment was entered with the 10 years imprisonment ordered to run consecutively with the sentence on the federal charges for the fake plane crash. So all that being said, I'm bringing you up to date. On September 25th of 2015, he was released on parole by the Florida Department of Corrections. And supposedly his you know parole ended in 2019. So he is now living here in the panhandle. Mm-hmm. He is in Santa Rosa County, which is so interesting to me because, you know, we used to joke about that when I was working for the local ABC affiliate that Pensacola was the invisible axis on which the world turned <laughs> yeah. because there were just so many strange stories mm-hmm. that ended up having connections here. And sure enough, here's this guy from mm-hmm. Indiana randomly crashes his plane and he's like, you know, this isn't such a bad mm-hmm. place to live. I camped out over there. I liked it enough. Wasn't really you know? part of my plan, but you know, yeah. I'm going to stay here. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of nice. Well, we do live in paradise. I say that all the time. We do. And he was facing 26 years for all those charges because those were some federal charges and he was in front of Judge uh, Roger Vinson that's here in Pensacola. You know, it's funny to me. This is why we're doing this show, Gulf Coast Confidential. We start out talking about a private pilot in Indiana. Well, how does that have to do with Gulf Coast Confidential? I know. Here we are. When that song keeps going through my mind, that old one, Lord, Indiana wants me. I can't go back there. <laughs> well, so did. let me go to Northwest Florida, <laughs> on the Gulf Coast. I'll go to Milton. <laughs> <laughs> and stay here. Uh, but yeah, so apparently he has carved out a life for himself, I believe remarried and, mm-hmm. and maybe trying to dabble in videography well, along those lines. Yeah. So it's interesting. Again, I do wonder, you know, why he decided to to settle down here. Yeah. I just think it was probably comfortable. It was, we're not a real judgy place here, I don't think. Can't really afford yeah. to be. No, we kind of live and let live. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is beach time down here. But I do wonder, like, what makes someone need all that attention mm-hmm. and to be have that much money? Because now he doesn't have any of that money, but hopefully he's happy. But, I mean, it's that, that grind, as people say, and that shuck and the jive and I got to get mm-hmm. ahead. Does it really matter? I know. And putting your priorities, you know, in those buckets, it cost him everything. Mm-hmm. It cost him his family. And uh, and, and and maybe he is happier now. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, if you're unhappy in your marriage mm-hmm. and, you're, and, and, and your business is how you support your family, then, then, then make responsible decisions so you're not leaving your clients holding the mm-hmm. bag. You're not leaving your family holding the bag. Because I can't imagine what it's like for his family to grow up with the reputation of being a shrinker because Mm -hmm. it's automatically for those who Mm -hmm. are familiar with the story or or who have access to Google and can Google it, Mm -hmm. they're going to know, oh, gosh, you're related to that guy. Right. And uh, and they don't have any money themselves, I imagine. Or it's been a struggle. Mm -hmm. Well, the daughter, I think her name is Alyssa, and she's 20-ish, I think. Well, she had kind of um, been living with a friend's family. And I think she'd gotten herself in a little bit of trouble, like shoplifting or not finishing Bless school or something. I know. Well, I mean, imagine all this. I can't I mean, imagine yeah, the stress of all of that. Yeah. She said her mom picked her up from school one day and she said, my mom never picks me up from school. You know, obviously she gets home in some safe way, but she said that her mom told her dad's crashed his plane. And she said, what do you mean? And I mean, she was a student at that time, so I don't think she went in real big detail with her. But this young lady named Alyssa, she does seem like she's got that live and let live, and I'm happy to be here on the planet Earth. They said she even buys her clothes from the Goodwill. Oh, wow. Because she's just happy being alive and having breath, and that she didn't put in that something. She doesn't put her future or her desires and stuff in the material things. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good U-turn, actually. She had to learn through it a little bit, but she doesn't mind working. She doesn't, she's she's just kind of like... Living a a regular life. Yeah, like a little hippie girl. Yeah, and it seemed like that maybe when Marcus Shrinker realized that he was going to have to be living a regular life and also facing the legal and moral consequences Mm -hmm. of some of his choices, I think he didn't want to. Yeah. Just flat didn't want to, just didn't want to face, pay the piper. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. I think that I think that the thank God for the manager of the KOA or the mm-hmm. rent collector or whatever, because, I mean, he could have Coumadin or the blood thinners. Mm-hmm. After you cut your wrist, you can totally bleed out. Then you take a handful of opioids. I mean, mm-hmm. you could literally 
to slay there and die. I know. And I am thankful that they did find him. I that am that too. was not a successful mm-hmm. attempt yeah. because that is not something, I mean, it, it, nothing's really worth taking mm-hmm. your life over. But mm-hmm. I don't say that with any judgment. People do do that. And yeah. it's a tragedy for their families as well as themselves. And I'm sorry that he felt like it. He that was mm-hmm. something that he needed to right. do. But I am thankful that it was not a successful attempt. Right. And hopefully, you know, he and his family are able to move on. Hopefully he mm-hmm. has a good relationship with his children. But it, if not, hopefully they, they're like the one daughter mm-hmm. that you talked about and rebuilding their lives. But you're right. I do feel like in so many of these crimes that we cover, whether it's some brutal killer or it's a case of fraud to a certain extent, that's what this is case is about. It's, mm-hmm. it's lying. Right. It's lying to your wife. It's lying to your clients. It's lying to the authorities. It's trying to do what you want to get out of being mm-hmm. in trouble because right. you want what you want. As it's we talk selfishness. about that. Yeah. It's selfishness. We talk about that all the time with narcissism. I want what I want and I'm going to do it when I want, how I want and where I want. And you are going to like it. Right. And if you don't <laughs> like it, then I'm going to go after you. And mm-hmm. I, I don't sense that with Marcus Shrinker that there's this, I'm going to go after the people that criticize no, me. No, I don't think so. Like some of these mm-hmm. terrible human beings that we talk about. I think with him, it was just more like, but I shouldn't have to do this. Surely I can talk my way out of mm-hmm. it. He's a yeah. nice looking guy. Yeah. Charming. He seems to be smart, charming. Yeah. Right. Had it all. And I, I think he was just a bit of a fast talker. Yeah. And he talked himself right into a bunch of trouble. Yeah. And I think he also romanticized life, obviously. He kind of had a delusional um, starting point or reference point or plumb line or whatever you want to call it. This way of thinking, I mean, I I saw the auction that they had of some of his stuff, and it was almost vulgar, the redundancy of things. You know, like, who needs 25 vases? Who needs 20 uh, lounge chairs? Who needs this? Who needs that? Who needs six motorcycles or whatever it was? But they did say that red motorcycle went for a pretty good penny. The one that was the getaway, <laughs> getaway bike. That's funny. Yeah. I know they said that Harley Davidson was the lien holder on the airplane, in fact. So that's oh, wow. who got some of the money back. So I guess he, he definitely liked his toys. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I'm a big fan of the Narco series, and I watch that pretty regularly. Uh, and, and then similar type shows. But to your point, like once these guys start making money, whether it's your big time dealers or your smaller dealers that are working for them or whatever jobs they mm-hmm. have, once they start rolling in the dough, it is so much, especially with with men, and I, I mostly these shows that I follow, it's following these these male characters um, based on true life. And there's women that have done the same thing, mm-hmm. so I don't mean. But but with the men, there's definitely this this show of like, I mean, Pablo Escobar bought a bunch of birds to sit in a tree yeah. that weren't supposed to fly away. There's these fancy mm-hmm. birds so that everybody could look at them, and and cars galore, and racing cars, and 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 motorcycles. And I just feel like with men in general. Their idea of success is just this opulence, some of them, mm-hmm. not all of them, mm-hmm. but, you know, and and not necessarily am I saying it's all criminal mentality. Yeah. Lots of people make money legitimately and want to have all kinds of houses and all kinds of cars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. However they make their money, it seems like a lot of times men especially want to do this, you know, look at all my golden eggs. Mm-hmm. Look <laughs> yeah. at all these yeah. wonderful things that I have. Mm-hmm. It's about these toys, and it's almost like these are extensions of themselves, yeah. and th- they mm-hmm. think that it makes them like a king or yeah. more important. Mm-hmm. When, when really we all just want to be treated well. Mm-hmm. You know, right. I mean, Love. nice things are great, but I mean, yeah. it can't be the end all be all. Right. Love and be loved type of thing. And I think men are programmed or made to be the provider and the protector and the fortress maker and this, that and the other. So I think that does. But I truly also think that all of this behavior and this thinking is the thinking of an adult. Addicted person. I think that's a great yeah. point. And also, I think his drug of choice was more. Absolutely. And more would maybe perhaps, whether it's him or someone else, feel that need to feel important, mm-hmm. to feel right. adequate, to right. feel like, like I am somebody. Right. Well, I'm, ha- I'm happy that he's okay. I'm happy that that suicide attempt did not work. Because what we're talking about, too, is called suicide, which is the act of faking your own death. And, I mean, I have to give it to people. They're a good storyteller trying to do some of that stuff. But um, I'm glad that all was an epic fail. I know. Absolutely. And uh, any takeaways for you? I think that's really yeah. what we'd been talking about, mm-hmm. our takeaways. Yeah. Or don't don't put all your eggs in the wrong basket. Right, right. You need to prioritize, right. you know, family and friends as well. But uh, that, that would definitely be my takeaway. Right. And I think uh, relationships are more important than transactions, and people should be over projects. And I think when really we're faced with it, look at him now. If he really, really wanted to go back to that old lifestyle, he's not a dummy. 
And he's not out of the game. I mean, no. he's 52 years mm-hmm. old. He still has right. plenty of life left to he's live. He's a pilot. He knows how to do some pretty cool stuff. So he's happy, and I'm glad. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope his family is as well. And, yeah. and you're right. This is, you know, this is certainly an opportunity to start over and to learn from their lessons. So mm-hmm. many cases that we cover, people are dead. They don't get another chance right. to start over. Or they end up in prison, and that's the starting mm-hmm. over point. That's right. the best it's going to get for them. Right. And that's not how this ended. No. He is out. His family is hopefully picking up pieces and moving on with their lives as well. They have the opportunity, if he wants to, to make amends. Mm -hmm. Whatever the case may be, he has those opportunities. Right, right. And he's in recovery now. Yeah. Well, Pam, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us as well for this episode of Gulf Coast Confidential. I'm your host, writer, and producer Molly Barrows with co-host and researcher Pam Hill. And a big thanks to director, editor, and production engineer James Roy. You can listen to more of our Gulf Coast Confidential episodes wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. You can also watch on my Gulf Coast Confidential YouTube channel. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button, right, Pam? Yes, subscribe. Subscribe, like, all those fun things. So again, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.